uh, over time, um, even in the experimental, this is raw experimental data. These are great projects for undergraduates, um, and they also help us in terms of getting gains for our systems, you know, like what can we aggregate to get a certain relationship between two systems. Uh, what you're looking at up here is to the left up there with cytokine instability, so that's looking at inflammation and how inflammation changes over time, which markers are the best for inflammation. Uh, over here on the right, we're looking more at failed compensatory recognition, um, com failed compensatory mechanisms. This is calcium. So calcium, like, initially is out of whack in the mice, then it kind of converges uh, to, to where it's not so bad, and then it blows up again, right? So here you can see that the body's actually trying really hard to fix this problem in these mice, but it can't, and so then it goes, it, you know, it blows up. Ironically, that convergence point is right around the time of onset, right? Or not so ironically. So it's looking for things like that in the data, right? So even if you don't have your big quilt, you can focus on your little patch and the relationships in that patch and still learn something using traditional methods and do so pretty quickly. Most of these papers that uh, up here are, are published within about three semesters of work, right? Uh, another technique that we like is called multi-treatment meta-analysis, and it's a little bit different from regular meta-analysis because you have, as the name implies, multiple treatments going on. And the point of multi-treatment meta-analysis is, instead of getting caught up on what the treatment is itself, is the timing of the treatment, all right? So because you have so much dynamics going on in ALS, it turns out that a treatment that you think would be favorable at day 60 in the mouse model could be very disfavorable at day 90. All right? So that means that we can't just get an ALS pill and give it to somebody. They take it the duration of the disease and, and expect it to work. We know that's not true because really it's all only works if it's given early in the disease course. All right? Otherwise, it's like placebo. All right? So what multi-treatment meta-analysis shows us is it's not just the magnitude of the gains, but also the timing. All right? So you've got to perfectly time certain uh, treatments to the disease. And that has to do with the complexity of the relationships. Because you, you remember that complex systems are always driven by the magnitude and the timing. All right? Magnitude and timing. If that's all you walk out of here with, um, then you, you've learned something that will help. All right? Uh, another aspect of uh, computational modeling of ALS is epidemiology, which is what you look at which patients had, like, uh, similar... Uh, antecedent conditions or uh, similar environmental exposures, that type of thing. Uh, when we looked at how uh, commonalities among patients, we actually saw that our patients were less sick, which seems kind of odd, right? An ALS patient that's dying from ALS is somehow, other than ALS, more healthy than the, the average person when you gender match and age match them, all right? So that's kind of interesting. But if you think about this, I told you just a while ago that in the mice, they actually have too high of a feedback gain, right? They tend to overreact. So what happens to a system that overreacts? If it overreacts, it responds very good, right? But if the perturbation gets to be too much and it over-responds, then it becomes unstable. So it could be that in these patients that they actually don't have things like high blood pressure and asthma and those types of things because they have hypervigilant regulation. Their gains, their feedback gains are so high that they keep their bodies within a really tight regulation. But the problem is, then when something really bad happens, then you have instability. And so it's, what was good actually becomes bad, all right? And this is something that you can see with the fact that these patients tend to be healthier. Not only do they tend to have less disease, they also tend to be athletes. Uh, or in the military, or people who are extremely fit. And I'm not giving you an excuse not to work out, um, but uh, I'm just saying there is something uh, to, you know, stability and regulation, all right? Can I um, you something on that one? Oh, sure. Go ahead. So, so when you say it on set age, it means that it's higher or... Yeah, so that means those? that they were, um, those who had those, they, they were older when they got ALS, right? So it's almost like the fact that they had other conditions, it delayed their ALS. Well, why did it delay their ALS? We think it delayed their ALS because their feedback gains weren't as high, all right? Okay. So they can control their perturbations a little bit better. Fine, I got arthritis, but that's not as bad as ALS, right? So it's kind of like when you're dealing with any engineered system, there's 
you know, pros and cons to having certain games, right? And so in the biology, yes, it is true. The younger people, um, you know, the younger you, you get ALS, you might live longer, but they tend to also be, quote, healthier. All right. But obesity is bad. What? Obesity is bad. <laughs> yeah, th yeah, that is the one thing. You know, what's weird about obesity is that, um, you know, these patients lose weight, all right? They lose weight because they can't eat and because they have a hypermetabolic state, all right? So they're burning calories much faster than somebody who's gender and age matched, okay? So you'd actually think that, well, maybe we need to feed them. There's actually been clinical studies that shown that if you do caloric restriction in ALS patients, they actually do better. Like, that's crazy, they're losing weight. But it goes back to this stability thing, all right, and the gains, all right? So it's pretty interesting. It's, that's why it's not always the way you see. You have to look at it from that system perspective. Otherwise, you look at this, and a clinician, when I first published this, one of the reviewers was like, are you crazy? Being healthier leads to ALS? I'm like, I didn't say just being healthier. It's, it's a dynamic thing, but they're not engineers, so they, they don't get what we're doing, right? So uh, yeah, it did finally get published, but it took a lot of convincing and teaching about dynamics. Um, Biomarkers. Another interesting thing about ALS is it has a lot of overlap with other neurological diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia. I won't go into all the biochemistry with you, but just that you can see by the numbers over there that not one of those is like specific to one of these diseases. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, this is a bit of an, on the last slide. Okay. But uh, other than liver disease and I believe. Diabetes? Yes. yes. Uh, it showed the duration was lower. Does that mean that for people who develop ALS, they tend to have uh, liver disease and diabetes not as easily treated? It's the opposite. If you have liver disease and diabetes, you're oh. less likely to get ALS. Oh, okay. I miss. Yeah. I, and I was... we're looking at that. There's actually one of the preclinical studies right now out on the market, or not out on the market, but like they're looking to put on the market, is a liver treatment for people who don't have liver problems, but as an ALS treatment, there seems to be some sort of tie between the liver, and then in terms of diabetes, what's really weird uh, in ALS is people who aren't diabetic, when they get ALS, they lose all this weight, and then all of a sudden they have high glucose. But yet, when they test their pancreas, they don't have diabetes, all right? So there's some sort of weirdness with ALS. Um, with the liver, we don't really know yet, other than if you have a liver disease, you're less likely to get ALS. Um, but with on diabetes front, they do get high blood sugar uh, during the, the midpoint of their disease, um, despite the fact that they're skinny as rails and you know can't hardly eat. So uh, it, it's pretty interesting. Yes? So are you suggesting a treatment for ALS is to induce like a liver disease? Or well, no, what I'm suggesting is that ALS is a multiscalar disease, and it's not just the motor neurons, all right? You've got to look at the whole thing. So there's some sort of feedback game between the liver and the motor neurons that is influencing ALS. That's my hypothesis. You know, we'll have to prove it, but. But anyway, ALS lies on a spectrum of disorders, and the fact that it shares so much with other diseases goes back to the fact that it's complex, it's multifactorial, and it's a system level disease. All right? Uh, about done here. All right, so back to the clinical intervention optimization. I told you that was important to me. I don't want to just work on curing ALS patients, I actually want to help the ones that are already uh, have ALS. Um, you guys are probably familiar with something called a BiPAP, bi-level positive airway pressure. It's kind of like a CPAP that's used for snoring. They, you, you wear a mask and it, it forces air into your lungs, okay? And for the patients that have respiratory problems, um, they use this as an intervention. Currently, Medicare standards say that you cannot get a BiPAP machine, which is like $2,000, until your forced vital capacity is half of what it should be, all right? Half, the reading is half of what it should be. Um, and we found in, an, in a, our analytics study, and this was just using traditional statistics and um, a couple other dynamic things, that that's not good. That if we just move that threshold from 50% to 80%, that you get 25 to 50% more conferred survival benefit. That's a lot for a patient that's dying, right? And all we gotta do is change the insurance standard. So I'm really excited about this work. Um, it's in review right now. We'll see how it goes, but uh, it, you know, 
it goes to show you that basically at 80%, most of these patients aren't actually having visible symptoms of breathing problems, but still at the system level, it's enough of an oscillation that it's triggering the disease to progress. So earlier access, despite the fact that they're not symptomatic, actually dictates what happens later on in the disease, okay? So that's an example of we're not necessarily curing ALS, we're slowing the progression maybe a little bit, maybe, and it may possibly be some palliative aspects to it. We're certainly increasing the quality of life, too, because what happens is the, um, our study also showed that while they're doing the BiPAP, that uh, they tend to have better motor function scores compared to the people who don't do the BiPAP, all right? Um, all right. So we like to use uh, cross-correlation analysis a lot, in the, a lot in these dendrograms to try and figure out how to aggregate data, all right? So sometimes um, what, what seems to aggregate doesn't. Uh, and so sometimes even like the respiratory metrics, you'd think that they would all aggregate together, but they don't. Uh, and so you can use cross-correlation analysis and let the data and the strength of the correlation kind of help guide you how to aggregate your data, especially in cases where you're not really sure, all right? So that's a really great tool. Uh, principal component analysis is another standard tool that we use a lot to try and what it does is explain the variance in the data. Uh, it also tells you how many components. Uh, you guys um, probably have seen this before. You do a PCA and you, you can see how many components explain the data. So say that you modeled like 100 things. It may only show that like 15 are significantly contributing to the disease. That's that dimensional restriction I talked about, right? So it's, it's amazing. I did one of these for Alzheimer's disease, and we all know that like amyloid beta is like the thing for our Alzheimer's disease. It turns out that amyloid beta isn't even one of the predicted components, okay? Well, no wonder there hasn't been a clinical trial with amyloid beta that's been successful. But until you do something like principal component analysis to see where these things lie in relation to one another when you map them out on a projection loading, you don't really know. So I think PCA is a great tool that you can use, um, you know, in your everyday computational work um, to, to learn a lot very quickly. Um, another tool we use a lot is random forest and machine learning. Uh, machine learning is great uh, to predict things like survival because there's so many things that we don't understand about truly how survival works in ALS. I mean, some people, the average is three years, but some people go 10 years. Why is that, right? And so we develop some um, machine learning models to try and predict so that you know, we know when a patient comes in based upon a certain uh, set of metrics or whatnot what their predicted uh, survival is. All right? And that's really important for clinical trials because there's so much heterogeneity in clinical trials that you know, based on who you pick for your ALS trial, you're going to dictate the outcome. If we pick a bunch of people that are, you know, have a, would go 10 years, versus pick a bunch of people that would go two years. So being able to predict things using machine learning um, is nice because that helps get better clinical trials that um, don't have so much you know, problems uh, where you're, you're swaying what the result is before you've even started. Um, okay, so another thing is uh, random force reduced models, all right? So we all like to reduce models as much as we possibly can because if they're easier to understand, and so one of the things that we learned with ALS is that duration and age actually influence it more than any of the other things, respiratory, even more than muscle scores, for crying out loud. So um, random force modeling, again, and being able to, you know, at some point you can only aggregate to a point to where you, you lose complete resolution. And so we play with that, right? How many parameters do we need to be able to get the answer that we're thinking? Um, we can get survival classification curves uh, from these so we can tell a patient which, which one that they're in. Uh, and then, kind of summing it up for you, uh, ALS viewpoint aggregation here. So overall, ALS is a system instability that results from hypervigilant regulation. The gains are just too high, all right? Uh, the treatments are very sensitive to, to dynamics, and it matters when you give them, all right? There's not one treatment that you can just give the whole time. Uh, we need better clinical metrics to, to reduce heterogeneity, all right? And then the optimized interventions, you know, we need more research on that to prolong life while, while we're waiting. So remember this quilt, right? We're trying to 
stitch together all these uh, packages.